Providence. During my junior year, I had begun taking required education courses to become a teacher. Father Louis Bannon, a Jesuit priest from whom I took psychology of education, encouraged me to pursue a high school teaching career. He was gentle and kind like Mr. Lemma, my sixth grade teacher. He taught by continually asking questions, which engaged us in heated but respectful discussions. My plans to become a high school teacher, however, were changed a few months before graduation. The fall quarter of my senior year, I received a letter in the campus mail from Professor Bernard Kronick, chairman of the political science department and director of fellowships, informing me that I had been nominated by the university for a Woodrow Wilson fellowship. He asked that I come by his office to pick up the application form. After my afternoon class, I went to see him. Thank you for coming. Please have a seat, he said in a low and reserved voice. He was a short, stocky man with glasses and was bald over the top and front of his head. He loosened his tie and took off his tight-fitting sport coat and draped it over the back of his chair. Congratulations, Frank, he said, leaning forward and handing me a large envelope. This is the application form you need to fill out. Thank you. I took the envelope and placed it on my lap. The Woodrow Wilson Fellowship Program is designed to encourage college graduates to consider college teaching as a career. But I'm planning to teach high school. Have you thought of teaching at the college level? No. I shook my head. Well, you shouldn't rule it out. As I said, these national fellowships are to encourage bright students like you to pursue college teaching. Think about it. I will, I responded half-heartedly, glancing down at the thick envelope. It's already an honor to be nominated, so don't be too disappointed if you're not awarded one. These fellowships are very competitive. I thanked him and went back to my room, sat at my desk, and opened the envelope. I read through the application, thinking, I'm not smart enough to teach in college. That evening... After closing the language lab, I told Laura about being nominated for the fellowship. That's wonderful. Congratulations. When I told her that I wasn't sure I should apply, that the application was really long and I didn't have time to fill it out, she said, you've got to be kidding. I remained silent for a few seconds as she patiently waited for a response. I glanced at her and then looked down and said, I don't think I have a chance. Of course you do, she said, smiling. Why would the university nominate you if you didn't? Suddenly I felt more weight on my shoulders. If you don't apply, you won't get the fellowship, she added. I worked on the application every day for several days. I wrote a personal statement describing my childhood experiences and explaining why I wanted to be a teacher. I asked Father Shanks, Dr. Vary, and Father O'Neill for letters of recommendation. Unfortunately, Dr. Hardman de Bautista had left the university, so I could not ask her for one. A few weeks later, after I had mailed the application, I received a letter from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation informing me that I was a regional finalist. I felt happy, but again, worried. The possibility of going to graduate school for a doctorate scared me. When I found out that I had an interview the following week at Stanford University, where the regional finalists were being screened, I felt even more tense. I rushed to see Father O'Neill to tell him about it. Good for you, he said in his soft, raspy voice. He stood up and shook my hand. Good for you, he repeated. He sat down slowly and placed his trembling hands on his lap. I'm worried about the interview. I don't think I'll do well. Of course you will. You have to be confident. Remember, God is on your side. When is the interview? Next week, Wednesday at 2 o'clock. You should dress nicely. Wear the suit Mrs. Hancock gave you. It's too big, I said. Even though it had been two years, I still couldn't get her husband's pinstripe suit to fit. 
Oh, it doesn't matter, he said thoughtfully. Just be sure to wear a tie. He got up slowly, moved behind his desk chair, and braced himself on the back of it with both hands. Can you do me a favor and accompany me to Macy's at Valley Fair? I need to buy some socks. It won't take long. Sure, I'd be happy to. I wondered why he invited me, but I thought it would be disrespectful to say no. As we headed to the Jesuit parking lot in the back of Farsi, I noticed he leaned slightly forward and his shoulders drooped a bit more than they had the year before. We drove to the large shopping center, which was about three miles from campus, and parked the white two-door sedan near Macy's. I followed him to the men's department where he picked up three pairs of black socks. He then made his way to the suit section and began examining various styles and colors. What size suit do you wear, he asked. I'm not sure. Here, try this one on. He took a blue suit jacket off the rack. It's a 40 regular. Oh, I can't afford to buy a suit. It doesn't cost anything to try it on. Try it. He grabbed onto the side of the rack as I slipped it on. It's too long. I looked at the price tag and frowned. He caught my eye, smiled, and shook his head. You must wear a 38 short. He rifled through the row of suits with his right hand while holding on to the top of the rack with his left one. Here's one. It's light green. Do you like it? At this point, I suspected that he was going to offer to buy it for me. Yes, I said, trying on the jacket. It fit perfectly. I grabbed the hanger and hung the jacket back with the trousers. I was about to place the suit back on the rack when Father O'Neill snatched it from me. You're wearing this to your interview, he said firmly. I'm buying it for you. I was speechless, even though I had guessed he wanted to buy it. My eyes welled up as I looked up at him. Giving me time to compose myself, he added, Actually, I am not exactly buying it. The Jesuit community is. After what seemed an eternity, I finally said, Thank you, Father. I'm sorry I don't have the words to tell you how much I appreciate this. You're welcome. Someday, you'll do the same for someone else. I had the suit pants tailored to fit, and two days later, Father O'Neill and I picked them up at Macy's. He also bought me a white shirt and tie to match the suit. When we returned to his office, he gave me an apple and an orange and a set of plain, square-shaped, gold-colored cufflinks. I want you to have these, he said, grinning. I've had them for years. I have another pair. I thanked him several times. As I was about to leave, he added, Don't forget, keep your head up. You'll do just fine in your interview. Trust in God. The day of the interview, I was as nervous as I had been the first day of classes my freshman year. I felt sick to my stomach. I attended early morning mass at the mission church and had a slice of toast with strawberry jam and a cup of tea for breakfast. After my two morning classes, I went back to my room, put on my new suit, had a light lunch in Benson, and drove to Stanford University in Ernie de Gasparis' Volkswagen, which I had borrowed from him the night before. As I headed north on Highway 101, I regretted having to miss my afternoon class on contemporary Latin American literature. This was the third time I had missed a class in college. The closer I got to Stanford, the more anxious I became. I took the Embarcadero Road exit, which turned into Galvez Street. The entrance to the campus was lined with palm trees, just like the entrance to the University of Santa Clara. I parked the car near a cluster of eucalyptus trees, which smelled like sweet gum. Their distinct odor reminded me of the time my family and I first arrived in Santa Maria from Mexico when I was four years old. We had only seven dollars and no place to stay, so we spent the night on a bed of leaves underneath eucalyptus trees. I closed my eyes for a few seconds. This feels like a dream, I thought to myself. I climbed out of the car and followed the directions to the quad, which had sandstone arches all around. I entered the main door to the history corner and spotted a small sign that read, 
Woodrow Wilson Interviews, Room 105. I took a deep breath, wiped my clammy hands on the sides of my coat, straightened my clip-on tie, and knocked on the door. A tall, thin man wearing a navy blue suit came out, greeted me, and introduced himself as Dr. Otis Pease. I remembered his name because it registered in my mind as Dr. Chicharos, the Spanish word for peas. However, I was so nervous that I did not learn the names of the other two men who were also wearing suits and were very friendly. I sat at a rectangular wooden table facing them with my feet wrapped around the legs of the chair to stop my legs from shaking. Each committee member had a file folder which I assumed contained my application and letters of recommendation. Dr. Pease, the chairman of the interview committee, began by commenting on my grades. Your academic record is impressive, he said, opening his folder and glancing at it. You have a 3.8 GPA overall in your last two years and a 3.9 in your major. Now, tell us about yourself and why you're interested in a teaching career. While I spoke, the three men smiled periodically and glanced at each other. This made me feel more at ease. Once I finished my response, the other two interviewers engaged me in the discussion about Spanish literature and Latin American literature and history, for which I was thankful, because I had taken several courses in the history of Mexico and South America from Dr. Matt Meyer, one of my favorite professors. At the end of the interview, Dr. Pease informed me that his committee would be making a recommendation to the Woodrow Wilson National Committee, who in turn would be making a final decision. A few days later, I received a letter from Hans Rosenhaupt, National Director of the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. It read, the selection committee which interviewed you has recommended you for an award and the national selection committee has accepted the recommendation. I'm happy to offer you a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship for the academic year 1966-1967. Since only 1,400 fellows were elected this year from over 13,000 carefully chosen nominees, this election demonstrates great confidence in your promise as a teacher and scholar. From funds supplied by the Ford Foundation, Woodrow Wilson Fellows receive a living stipend, free tuition, and fees at a graduate school of their choice, and their graduate school receives an additional subvention. While a Woodrow Wilson Fellow is not obliged to become a college teacher, he is expected to complete one year of graduate study and to give serious thought to a career in college teaching. The members of the National Selection Committee and the trustees join me in warm congratulations on the honor bestowed upon you. I could not believe it. I read the letter twice to make sure it was addressed to me that I would not have to work as a prefect for room and board or take out loans from the federal government was also impossible to believe. I said a prayer before the image of the Virgen de Guadalupe tacked above my desk and dashed out of my room to thank and share the good news with everyone at the university who was close to me. Father Shanks, Father O'Neill, Dr. Vary, Laura, Emily, and Smokey. I called Roberto and Darlene and told them. They were as thrilled as I was and promised to tell the rest of the family. Once I calmed down that evening, a wave of fear came over me. What if I didn't have time to work while I was in graduate school to help my family? What if I failed graduate school? These thoughts kept me awake all night. The next morning I felt exhausted and discouraged. I reread the letter and hurried to Walsh Hall to see Father Shanks. You need to have more self-confidence, Frank. There is no doubt in my mind that you will succeed in graduate school. You wouldn't have been awarded the fellowship if you weren't capable of handling graduate work. Just think, with a doctorate, you'll be able to teach at a university or be a consultant to our government on international relations. With regard to your family, don't worry. Graduate fellowships provide stipends for dependents. Learning that fellowships made funds available for dependents and his confidence in me 
eased my worries. I could use grant money to help support my family. Two weeks before graduation, I received a second letter from Hans Rosenhaupt encouraging me to attend Columbia University rather than Emory University, the two graduate schools to which I was advised to apply at the time I was nominated for the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship. He wrote, Considering the academic advantages, also the possibility of continued support at Columbia, I would urge you to accept Columbia's offer. Let me know by collect telegram if you are willing to attend Columbia University. After sending the telegram to the Woodrow Wilson Foundation informing them that I would be attending Columbia, I made a visit to the Mission Church and gave thanks for this unexpected blessing. Commencement. In a couple of days I'll be graduating from Santa Clara, I told myself, as I finished taking my ethics final, the last exam of my college career. I turned in my blue book to Father McQuillan and left the classroom feeling happy and relieved. On the way to my room in Dunn, I passed by the olive trees lining the mission gardens and looked at the lush green lawn and the tall date palms. The beds of red, pink, yellow, and white flowers planted around their base looked like colorful skirts. I sat on the front stairs of Farsi, thinking about graduation and going to Columbia. I watched the little goldfish silently gliding in the pond. I glanced up and spotted a white cloud moving slowly across the light blue sky and followed it with my eyes as it changed shape several times until it faded away. Suddenly, the thought of leaving Santa Clara made me feel sad. After graduation, I would no longer spend time with Laura. I would no longer visit Father O'Neill in his office and take walks with him. I would no longer see Emily and Smokey or go to after-game school dances or browse through the stacks in Oradri Library for enjoyment. My freshman year, I had been eager to see time pass by quickly, especially when things were difficult at home. Now... I wished for time to stop. I went back across the mission gardens and entered the mission church, where time often seemed to stand still. I knelt down and said a prayer before the painting of St. Francis at the cross, the same one I had prayed to so many times before, and enjoyed the silence and the scent of incense and burning candles. I remained there for a long while, and then returned to my room feeling happy and sad at the same time. On Friday night, I called Roberto from the payphone booth, which was two doors down the hall from my room, to give him the details about graduation. I shut the glass door tight and held my hand to my right ear to block out the noise coming from students who were celebrating the end of the school year. We're all excited, Panchito. Tomorrow is the big day. We're driving up really early. Who's coming? Mom, Torito, Ruben, and Rora are coming too, but not Trampita. Why not? He couldn't get out of work. I immediately felt disappointed and guilty. The noise in the hallway annoyed me. I opened the door halfway, poked my head out, and told students who were horsing around to be quiet. They gave me a dirty look. Whatever you say, Mr. Big Shot Prefect, I heard one of them say. I won't be missing this, I thought. I slammed the door shut. Sorry for the interruption, I said. I feel really bad that Trampita is not coming. I know. Me too. After a brief silence, Roberto added, But he'll be there in spirit, just like Dad. I felt my throat tighten. The last we had heard from Tia Chana about my father was that he was recovering from his depression but continued to suffer back problems. My mother and younger siblings had not lost hope for his return. But, like Trampita, Roberto and I had doubts. Our family talked about going to see him once we could afford the trip. At the end of our conversation, we agreed to meet in front of the mission church right after commencement. That same evening, I invited Emily and her mother and Laura to my graduation and made reservations for lunch at the Pine Cone Inn a restaurant in Valley Fair that Father O'Neill had recommended. Saturday morning, I climbed out of bed late after having spent half the night awake, thinking about graduation and wondering what my life would be like.
Bank in New York. I took a shower and quickly got dressed in my black gown with long pointed sleeves and a white hood. I raced across campus, carrying my mortarboard cap in my right hand, and joined my classmates in line, which began in front of the Mission Church and snaked back to O'Connor Hall. Looking like a lineup of penguins, my classmates and I anxiously waited for the commencement procession to begin. As soon as the U.S. Army band began playing Pomp and Circumstance, we started moving slowly, passing the front of the Mission Church. We turned right at the end of it, and continued under an arbor overflowing with purple wisteria flowers. We circled around the statue of the Sacred Heart, went through an archway in the adobe wall, and entered the mission gardens and began filling the rows of plastic chairs facing a makeshift stage behind the Jesuit residence. The faculty and administrators marched at the end of the line and took their seats on stage. Wearing colorful gowns and caps of various shapes and sizes, they looked like a flock of peacocks. Thousands of spectators filled the gardens all around, some sitting, others standing with small children on their shoulders. After the Reverend Philip J. Oliger, chaplain of the university, gave the invocation, William P. Fay, the ambassador to Ireland, delivered the commencement address. I half listened to him. Wondering whether or not my family had made the ceremony on time, I craned my neck trying to spot them. My classmates and I became fidgety as an endless number of degree candidates from the School of Business and the School of Engineering were called individually on stage to receive their diplomas. Our restlessness vanished, however, when Father Thomas D. Terry, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, was introduced. We all stood up and cheered as he presented our group to receive our diplomas. As it got closer to my name being called, I became increasingly excited and nervous. Finally, I heard it. My heart raced ahead of me as I climbed the stairs to the stage. I felt as though I were in a dream, observing myself gliding in slow motion toward Father Patrick Donahoe, the president of the university, and reaching out for my certificate. Smiling and shaking my hand, he handed it to me. I clutched it against my chest with both hands and returned to my seat. It happened too quickly, I thought. I sighed, tuned out everything for a moment, and replayed the experience of graduation over and over in my head. At the end of the ceremony, I made my way to the front of the mission church where countless families and friends were hugging and congratulating graduates and taking pictures. I spotted my family, waved, and moved through the crowd to meet them. Roberto caught my eye and walked toward me, followed by the rest. We're proud of you, Panchito. He gave me a strong, warm hug. I hugged him back, resting my chin on his broad shoulder. Congratulations. You did it, Darlene exclaimed. We all did it, I responded. I had a lot of help, especially from you and Toto. Estoy muy orgullosa de ti, mijo, my mother said, tearing up and stroking my left cheek with her right hand. I am so proud of you. I embraced her. Torito, Ruben, and Rora encircled us, locked hands, and hugged both of us. From the corner of my eye, I saw Emily and her mother and Laura standing on the side. Mama, these are my best friends, Laura Facchini and Emily Bernabe and her mother. Pleased to meet you, my mother said, smiling and wiping her tears with a white embroidered handkerchief. Although I had not seen it for many years, I recognized it right away. I was surprised she still had it. My father had given it to her one Christmas. My family had moved to Corcoran that winter to pick cotton after having picked grapes in Selma. It was a very difficult winter. It rained day after day, and we went weeks without work because we were not allowed to pick cotton when it was wet. Our family, like many other migrant families living in that labor camp, struggled to get by. A young man and his wife came to our cabin trying to sell their meager possessions to buy food. We were broke too but my father wanted to help them. He bought the handkerchief which the wife had embroidered and surprised my mother with it on Christmas Day. Remember
remembering my father's goodness and loving gesture that Christmas made me miss him even more. Panchito has told me about all of you, my mother said. Then, directing her attention to Mrs. Bernabe, she said, Thank you for taking care of Panchito and treating him like a son. He's a good boy. Most of the time, Mrs. Bernabe said, winking at my mother. Panchito told me your cooking is just as good as mine, my mother said. Then, with a big grin, she added, You must be a great cook. You must be too, Mrs. Bernabe responded. Let me take a picture of the four of you, Darlene said, taking the camera from Roberto and snapping it. Laura and Emily standing to my right, and Emily's mother to my left. After taking more pictures, we all headed to the Pinecone Inn for lunch. At the restaurant, we sat at a long table near the entrance and ordered. Roberto, who was across from me, excused himself and returned with two gifts, a large one and a small one. He handed me the large one with a card. I read it silently. Panchito, on our way to your graduation, I did a lot of thinking on the road. I was thinking of the way we used to live when we were little. What brought this to my mind was when I saw people working in the fields along the way near Gonzales. I also remember the day you went off to college. I had mixed emotions. By this, I mean I was happy for you, but at the same time, I didn't want you to go because I was going to miss you. I thought of your graduating from college, and I feel so proud that my heart feels like bursting. Love, Toto. Thank you, Toto. I felt a lump in my throat. Darlene, who was sitting next to him, put her arm around him and tenderly kissed him on the cheek. I took a sip of water, cleared my throat, and tore the gift open. It was a small, blue, portable typewriter with a case. Darlene and I figured you'd need it at Columbia. Smokey won't be around to loan you his, he said, smiling and wiping his eyes. This is perfect. Thank you. I placed it back in the box. My mother began to choke up. Columbia is so far, mijo. I wish you didn't have to go so far. Panchito needs to open another gift, Roberto said, noticing my uneasiness. This one is from Mrs. Hancock. He handed me a card in a small box, wrapped in blue paper. The card read, The captain and I are very proud of you. Congratulations and good luck at Columbia. Affectionately, Marion Hancock. Inside the box was a round, gold-colored wristwatch. I strapped it on my left hand and showed it off. Torito, who was sitting next to me, pulled my hand down to see it. It has no numbers. You won't be able to tell time. That's why I'm going to Colombia. I need to learn my numbers, but time is on my side. Everyone booed politely at my bad joke. After we finished eating, I raised my glass of water to make a toast. I want to thank all of you for making a difference in my life. Thank you, Mama, for your courage, faith, and love. Toto, for your sacrifices for our family and for being like a second father to me. Darlene, for your hospitality and love. Emily and Mrs. Bernabe, for giving me a home away from home. And Laura, for your friendship and wisdom and for accepting me for who I am. What about Torito, Ruben, and me? Rora protested. Thanks for being great brothers and a terrific sister. And for taking my pennies, Rora. My sister made a bad face and crossed her arms, pretending to be upset. We looked at each other and laughed. The waitress came by and handed me the check. Roberto tried to snatch it from me, but I quickly hid it behind my back. Let me pay, he insisted. My brother was squeezed between my mother and Darlene, so he couldn't easily move away from the table. I rushed and paid the bill before he could get to the cashier. 
I'm your big brother and you have to obey me, he said, half seriously. I know, but it's the least I can do to thank all of you for helping me. You've always been stubborn. We left the restaurant in the middle of the afternoon and went back to the university. After we said goodbye to Emily and her mother, my family came up to my room and done and rested while Laura and I went to visit Smokey and his wife Mary, whom he had married during Christmas break of our senior year. They lived a few blocks away from campus on Homestead Avenue. We stayed there briefly, and then I drove Laura to the Santa Clara train station to take the train back home to San Carlos. We sat in the car waiting for the train. I have a graduation gift for you, she said. She reached into her purse, pulled out a tiny box wrapped in yellow paper and handed it to me. Thank you, but you didn't have to, I know. I hope you like it. I slowly unwrapped it, trying not to tear the paper, which was the same color as her dress. I carefully folded the wrapping, placed it in my shirt pocket, and opened the small black velvet box. These are beautiful. I took out a pair of oval-shaped, gold-brushed cufflinks and a tie clip to match. Thank you, thank you. I reached over and gave her a kiss. We heard the train whistle. The train's coming, she said. I hate goodbyes, I said, feeling a pain in my chest. I do, too. She had a sad smile on her face. I got out of the car, went around it, and opened the door for her. I'll write, I said. Maybe I can borrow my brother's car and come up on a weekend during the summer and visit. My voice cracked. I'd like that very much. She boarded the train, looked out the window, and waved goodbye. I waved back and followed the train with my eyes until it disappeared. The days that summer seemed to go by more quickly than in previous summers, even though the routine was the same. I worked for the Southern County's gas company during the day, five days a week, painting meters and dispensing supplies from the warehouse, and in the evenings and on weekends for the Santa Maria window cleaners. Again, I lived with Roberto and Darlene and visited my mother, Trampita, Torito, Ruben, and Rora, only on Saturdays and Sundays after work. What differed, however, was that at the end of every day, I went home excited, hoping to receive mail from friends I had made at Santa Clara, especially Laura, whom I visited once during that time. I could not see her more often because I had to work. As time passed, I became more and more nervous and began to make preparations to leave home and move to New York. I bought a small used footlocker at the Salvation Army, packed it with my clothes and books, and shipped it by Greyhound bus to my new address, 817 John J. Hall, Columbia University. I hated to move again. As a child, I had yearned for stability, for a place I could call my own. The sense of permanence that I had found living in Bonetti Ranch and at Santa Clara was now gone. Saying goodbye to my family at the bus terminal on the day I left for Columbia, was just as sad and difficult as the day I went to college my freshman year. This time, though, I was going far away. After hugging and kissing everyone, I boarded the bus. I took with me the card of the Virgen de Guadalupe that my father had given me on the first day of college, the portable typewriter, and the notebook in which I had jotted down recollections about my childhood experiences during college. I waved to my family from the window and cried silently, knowing that I would not see them again for an entire year. Travel was too expensive to come home for holidays. In San Jose, I transferred to another bus that took me directly to the San Francisco International Airport. I went up to the airport counter to check in. Your name, please? The attendant asked. Francisco Jimenez, I responded. Going to the Big Apple? Yes, I'm going to graduate school to become a college teacher. <laughs>